with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 John today. And we're going to continue our series on the book of 1 John. Last week we talked, uh, we kind of went through the first chapter of 1 John. Talked a lot about how um, really, you know, we read, we read some in chapter 2 and 3 also, but just showing how you cannot embrace darkness and be saved at the same time. Um, and, and if you need to get clarification on that, you can go back and watch the, the first sermon. It's on the website. But basically, the, the first chapter of John, is there's two main points in that first chapter. The first one is this. You cannot embrace darkness and be saved at the same time. I don't know if you know it or not, but we have a lot of people doing that today. They, they want to embrace a particular lifestyle of sin. They want to embrace darkness. They want to embrace um, a lifestyle that is outside of what God has uh, ordained and still call themselves a Christian. You can't do that. The Bible says that when you embrace darkness, you reject God. So there's, that's, the, that's the whole message of the first chapter of, of 1 John. You really can't confuse it. It's very clear. But the other part, and, and this is the second part I wanted to get to today, he addresses what happens when a Christian sins. So there's a big difference between a person who embraces darkness versus a Christian who sins but hates their sin. Okay, there's a big difference between that. The Bible no, uh, the Bible is very clear that Christians are going to sin. And this is going to sound like a strange, a strange message this morning because I'm going to prove to you that Christians sin. Okay? As if you needed proof. I think uh, if you are Christian, you know that Christians sin. Uh, and it will make sense by the end of this sermon why this is an important topic. But in the book of 1 John, he begins to explain that Christians do sin, but what should happen when we do sin? What, what should our lives look like, and how should we go about getting restoration? So I, I just want to establish first off this morning that when a Christian sins, they are still saved. Okay, this is the, this is the whole really premise of my message this morning, but I'm going to just throw it out there rather than hold you in suspense. I'm going to tell you the whole point is that this, when a Christian sins, they are still saved. Now, you may go, well, we know that. Everybody knows that. No, everybody doesn't know that. As a matter of fact, when I was a teenager, I remember going to a church in this town, as a matter of fact. I was a teenager, and I went to a youth ministry in this city, and the youth pastor, who, whom I liked a lot, he was an older man, uh, you know, older than I was at the time. He was in his 40s, probably. And uh, he was preaching a sermon, and his whole sermon was about how if you sin, if you commit even one sin, you are no longer saved, and you better repent immediately, because if you die in that, in that unrepentant state, then you are going to go to hell. So every night... You have to repent of your sin, you have to name your sin, you have to confess your sin, and you have to repent of it. And if you happen to die before you can repent, then you're going to hell. Well, I knew that wasn't right. I had been raised in church my whole life, read the Bible my whole life. I knew that wasn't right, but I wish you could have seen the, the, the altar call response that he had at the end of that sermon. Every teenager in the place said, good Lord. <laughs> If that's true, every one of us are going to hell, and uh, we better make our way up there real fast. So everybody at the end, you know, went up, and they prayed, and they begged God for forgiveness. But the Scripture is very clear that every time we sin, we are not unsaved, and then when we repent, we're resaved again. Amen. We don't, we don't commit a sin, and then we lose our salvation, and then, and then until we can repent, you know, we've got to... Uh, walk on pins and needles or, or be afraid that it, or, or even be afraid that there might be some sins we've committed that we didn't know about and so we're in a, in a place of being unsaved until we can repent again. No, that's not what the Bible teaches and I'm going to prove that to you this morning. And it, it actually also brings up an, another interesting topic which is the, the topic of suicide because I get this question a lot as a pastor. I've had many people ask me this question over the years. Well, I had a friend or a loved one who committed suicide, you know, did they go to hell? And I always tell them the same thing. I say, whether or not this person that you're describing is in hell has nothing to do with whether they committed suicide or not. Because I don't believe that you can commit one sin and it caused you to go to hell. I don't believe that. What it has to do with is were they born again or not? Were they saved or not? Now, you could discuss and argue, well, if a person was born again... Then, uh, and they were truly saved and they were truly born again, then they couldn't commit suicide. That's a whole other discussion. 
But if a born-again, saved person commits a sin and then they immediately die, they're not going to hell. And, and you don't need to have that holding over your head, because uh, being held over your head, because that's not what Scripture teaches. I'm getting a lot of blank stares this morning. Some are going, yeah, I knew that. Some are going, I'm not sure about this. But I'm going to show you from the Word of God this morning. Now, let me give you some reasons why I know that a Christian who commits a sin is still saved. And, and I got to stop here and say, I'm not advocating sinning this morning, okay? I'm not telling you this so you can go, oh, good, I could go out and sin. No, we're going to get to that. That's not the point. But I want to give you just a few reasons. The, the first reason, and these are not necessarily in order, but first reason that I know a Christian who sins is still saved is because even in the old covenant, when a person would sin, they were not immediately rejected by God. And how many of you know that we have a better covenant with better promises now in the New Testament than they did in the Old Testament? As a matter of fact, they did not offer sin offerings every single day. The priest made sacrifices every day, but the individuals did not make sin offerings every single day. They would make them occasionally throughout the year. But how many of you know that the book of Hebrews teaches that Jesus made the sacrifice once and for all? It doesn't have to be done on a regular basis. It was done once and for all. So even in the old covenant, people that, that the people of God that was sin were not immediately rejected by God. No, there was, there was space for repentance. There was mercy. There was grace for that. Now, number two, practically we know that this is true because we see it lived out in our own lives and in the lives of others, both present day and throughout history. In other words, if being a Christian... Being a born-again believer meant that you never sinned again, then we would have examples of just that happening in our own lives and in history. But I can't look around this room, I can't look around the world and find a single person that I believe is born again that never sins. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how big a church you pastor, doesn't matter how big of a ministry you're over, they, they still sin. Now, I don't believe they want to sin, I don't believe they intentionally sin, but they still sin. Also in history, you can't look throughout history and you go, okay, maybe everybody's reprobating our generation and they're all unsaved and everybody's on the way to hell. Well, what about in history? Would you, would you go through history and pick out all the great people of God, all the great men of God? Can you find anyone that had a perfect, blameless, sinless life? Only Jesus. Even throughout the scripture, men of God still made mistakes. Mighty men and women of God, people that God held up as pillars of the church, still made mistakes and still had sin in their life. Those are just a couple practical examples, but the, the real reason that we know this is because we see it in the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. They're going to put it on the screen for you. Hebrews 12, 3. It says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So the writer of Hebrews is talking to Christians and he's telling us to consider Christ, to look to him so that we don't get weary or faint-hearted. Verse 4, in your struggle against sin, everybody say struggle. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when repro reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So just let me say this. Number one, if you were born again and that meant you'd never sin again, then how many know there would not be a struggle against sin? And there would be no need for the discipline or the chastisement of the Lord. There would be no need for the correction because you'd never sin again and you wouldn't need the discipline or the correction of the Lord. But he's writing to Christians here and he says, My son. How many of you are glad that when we sin and the Lord brings his discipline that he calls you son or daughter? Praise God. That, that shows you right there that you're in the beloved because he calls you a son. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. That'd be his sons and his daughters, the ones that, that he loves, that are children of God, born again. Yeah, we need, we need correction and we need discipline from time to time because we're not perfect and we make mistakes. Now, he won't leave you in your sin. You know, when you, when you sin, and I've... You've, if you've been coming to this church for any amount of time, you take this in balance with everything that I, that I teach. 
But, you know, when, he, when we sin, the Holy Spirit's going to correct it in our lives. And especially depending on where you're at and your maturity with Christ, He's going to correct it. He's going to want to deal with it. As the Scripture says, He's going to discipline you in a loving, the way that a loving, godly father should do. But you are, it's from a position of you being a son or a daughter. And this is why it's so important to understand because we've got a, a lot of people that don't understand how sin was purchased and how it was paid for. And so they think every time they, every time they sin, they, they, they become overwhelmed with this great weight and this great guilt of condemnation. But the book of Romans says that for those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. So, we have to understand that, yes, God wants to deal with sin in our life, but when you understand what I'm talking about this morning, then what, you, what it does is it puts up a, a wall of protection where the enemy can't come and lie to you about your position in Christ Jesus. God wants to correct you and deal with sin in your life from a position of a father who loves his kids. Not from a position of a taskmaster that is ready to send you to hell at the first moment that you make a mistake. That's not the relationship that he wants you to have with him. But it is the relationship that Satan wants you to have with him. Where God is just ready to strike you down. He's ready to cast you into outer darkness the first mistake that you make. But that's not the God that we serve. The blood of Jesus... And the cross actually made it easier for people to follow God, not more difficult. The reason that Jesus came in the first place, the reason that the cross had to happen is because no one could follow the law. It was too burdensome. And the law was not just, you know, keep clean and uh, wear this type of thread and these types of Jewish things that we don't normally think about. No, the law included sin as well. The Ten Commandments are part of the law. But people couldn't keep them. And so Jesus, God sent Jesus because he was not content with people being far from God. And he wanted to make a way that people had access to him through the blood of Christ. And the primary way is, is through faith. Amen. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Paul's writing. I'm just going to read you a few scriptures this morning on this topic. It says, since we have these promises, beloved, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Bringing holiness to completion. Bringing holiness to completion. So he says, he's talking to save people in the church, and the first thing he says is, listen, Clean, let, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body. Now, if when you got saved, you had no sin of, in your life, and automatically all sin was washed away uh, as far as no sin in your life, period, he'd have no reason to tell the church, cleanse yourself from every defilement. In other words, this is something we're going to have to work at. This is something we're going to have to grow in. This is something we're going to have to progress in. This is something that we're going to have to be intentional about. It's not going to just happen naturally because you got saved. But a lot of people have been deceived and lied to on that. And they think, well, if I was really saved, I'd never sin. But the enemy takes that and causes people to doubt their salvation. But you have to be secure in your place before Christ that, no, I'm loved. I'm accepted. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of God. Now... If you're just embracing sin and you're wanting to sin and you're looking for this as an excuse to sin, then you probably are not saved and you need to go back and listen to last week's message. But I'm talking to people that they love God, they're wanting to follow God, they don't want to sin, but they occasionally do. This is what the Word of God teaches. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion. So what that means is along the quote-unquote holiness scale, we have people of, of all different places. We have people that are closer to bringing holiness to completion. We have some that are not so close. And uh, the Lord is working on them, and He's dealing with them. The Holy Spirit is working with them. But it's not our job to look at people and decide where, they at are, where they're at on the holiness scale and how right they are with God or any of that nonsense. 
our place and our responsibility is to proclaim the blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, the acceptance of Christ, and then admonish people, as Paul said, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Another reason I know that a Christian who sins is still saved or that Christians occasionally sin is because if when we became saved, we became perfect, then we should immediately go back to following the law. The cross would not be needed. The blood would not be needed. In other words, once we got saved, if our spirit was born again and now we were perfect and we would never sin again, then we could go back to following the law. Because there's nothing wrong with the law. Matter of fact, it was God's original design. And if we could have followed it perfectly, that would have been His will. But the reason that we do not go back to the law is because we are still not able to keep the law even after we are saved. We're no, no, even a person who's been born again is not able to go back and follow the law. And we have an entire book in the New Testament that rebukes Christians who were trying to do just that, and that is the book of Galatians. The whole book of Galatians is written to a group of Christians who were trying to go back and follow the law. And listen to what Paul said to them, Galatians 2, 21. This is home in Christian standard version. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. In other words, if my right standing with God, even after salvation, okay, this is, sometimes people think, well, yeah, this is talking about before you got saved. No. Even after you were saved, if your right standing with God comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. And I love how Paul said it. He said, I do not set aside the grace of God. His point is this. I was saved by grace, and I will continue to live by grace Present day, future, all of eternity, it will be by the grace of God. I'm never going to set aside the grace of God and go back trying to be made right with God through my, through my own righteousness or my own good works. As we see many times from Scripture, we should strive for good works, but not in order to be righteous before God. Not, you know, I mean... I, we could sit up here all day and read a thousand scriptures that tell us to live holy and how to live. But it's not for the purpose of trying to obtain righteousness. Our faith has to be no righteousness comes through the blood of Christ and his sacrifice that he made on the cross. So with a perfect nature, we could, we could, continue, we could go back to following the law. But we can't. Even after we're saved, we can't follow the law. We still have to trust in the grace of Jesus Christ and in his blood. I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't know about you. But I, I love depending on His grace. I love this new system. I love that my acceptance in the Father is not dependent on me doing everything just right. I love to know that my salvation is secure and that if I make a mistake or I sin or I, I step up, that I'm not immediately booted out and I'm on my way to hell until I can find time to repent. A lot of people live under that condemnation. That's, that's the reason... While some people, every single time they come to church, they get saved again. Every time they come to church, they, 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 hear, they hear the sermon and they go, Oh my God, I'm, I need to get saved again. And they'll raise their hand at the end because they just their heart's so pure and so right before God. And they feel terrible. They want to get, get made right again. Listen, if you gave your life to, to Christ, you are a son. You are a daughter of God. You are accepted. You don't have to get saved again. You just repent. Let God love you. And continue in this process of completing holiness in your life. The Bible has a lot to say, uh, and I mentioned some of this last week, but the Bible has a lot to say about sanctification in the life of a believer. Now, the word sanctification in the New Testament just means to be set apart. In other words, set apart from the world. That's really the, the idea there, is that we would be separate from sin, separate from the world, living holy as the people of God. But the Bible is so clear that sanctification is a process. Sanctification is not a complete work at salvation. And I said this last week, but it needs to be repeated again. Salvation is an inner work in your spirit, in your heart, where you become a new creation. But even after you're saved, your mind still has to be renewed. The book of, uh, of uh, Romans teaches us that our mind has to be renewed. As a matter of fact, that's why you're here this morning. If when you got saved, 
you immediately begin to think like God and you knew the Word of God inside and out, there'd be no reason to be at church this morning. But we're all here because our minds are being renewed to think more like God and more in line with God's Word. This is a, a process. And again... Believers are all along the spectrum of how far their mind is renewed. There are some that from the day they got saved, they never cracked the book. There are some that have been saved for 15 years and they never cracked the book. Well, their mind is not going to be very renewed and there will be consequences and results of that. But if somebody, that's why you can see somebody who's been saved only like two years versus somebody who might have been saved 10 or 12 and they far, the one who's been only saved two years can far surpass them because they've been renewing their mind in the Word of God. I see it all the time. I see people all the time that come into the faith and they grow fast and quick because they renew their mind with the Word of God. Well, what's happening? They're taking that salvation that happened on the inside and they're letting it work itself outward. So when you, when you become saved, your spirit is immediately born again. You are a new creation in Christ, but your mind still has to be renewed. And, there's some, and that salvation has to be worked out to your, your body, your natural life as well. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. I love this scripture. It says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Now you have to, to, to really understand what Paul, the argument that Paul's making here, you really need to read the entire book of Romans. I know most people probably aren't going to go home and read the whole book of Romans today. But if you ever have time, you should sit down and really read the book of Romans from start to finish. It's, uh, what is it, 16 chapters? Nobody knows. Okay, good. You don't know if I'm wrong then. All right. <laughs> Look it up later. But you really have to read the whole, the, whole chap, the whole book. Because he's making an argument of what really happened on the cross and what it really means. Now this word, he, he says, since therefore we have now been justified. Justified is a legal term. That, that means absolved of all debt. Okay? So he says, since you've been justified. In other words, since your debt was legally paid. And, and this is so important to understand that what happened on the cross was more of a legal transaction than anything else. So in other words, if you had a gigantic debt that you owed to the IRS and you walked into the court and they declared that your debt was paid and it was over, and the judge, you know, hit down his, his gavel, and it was over. Debt is paid. How many know when, the, when you got a letter in the mail the next time, you could just shred it? You got a letter from the IRS saying, hey, you, you owe this. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's already been declared that I am not guilty. It's already been declared that my debt is free. If somebody showed up to the door, all you'd have to do is show them, you know, the piece of paper. Say, no, no, it, the judge made the decree, made the order. It's over. My debt is paid. And... That's how, that's how it is in the court of God. God declared you, when you put your faith in the blood of Christ, He declared you not guilty, debt paid. So when Paul says, since we have been justified or legally made right with God by the blood, he says, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. So, so here's what he's saying. He's saying, when you were saved and a judgment occurred about you, Justification is a decision that God makes about you, and that is that you are not guilty and that your debt has been paid. So he says, when you gave your life to Christ, you put your faith in his blood, he said, your sins, your debt was canceled. What, what sin is that? Well, first, first is the sin that we all incurred from our forefather, Adam. The Bible's very clear that whether you ever committed a single sin in your life or not, you were on your way to hell because of what Adam did. People may not understand that. It's a long uh, teaching that I'm not going to be able to do it this morning. But just simply understand, if you were whatever family you were born into, you know, I don't like my family, you know, they're, they're a bunch of knuckleheads and I got all coming. Yeah, but you were born into that family and whatever you're born into, you reap the consequences of it just because you were born. You didn't get to pick where you were born. It's a lot like that. We were born into Adam's family and as such, we incurred the sin and the debt of Adam. So when he says you are justified from what? Number one, from your sin nature and the, the debt that you incurred because of Adam, but also because of your own sin. He said that debt was paid. And I, so that's past, but now he says much more 
shall we be saved, that's going forward, from the wrath of God. So we were justified past tense and we will continue to be saved from the wrath of God because of the blood of Jesus. Verse 10, he explains it a little further. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And I love this passage because what he's saying is, he says, how, when we were enemies of God, we were still reconciled by God by the death of his son. Even when you were a total enemy of God, he still reached out to you to cause salvation in your life. He says, how much more now that we are saved, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? So his point is this, you were saved when you were a sinner by the blood, and you will continue to be saved by the blood even while you are a Christian. So it, it, the process doesn't change. It's not like we got saved by grace when we were sinners, but now that we've become Christians, we've got to start living holy lives in order to obtain the favor of God or the righteousness of God. He said, no, the process is the same. We were reconciled by the blood when we were enemies. We continue to be saved by the blood now that we are his friends. The New Century Version says it even clearer. This is the uh, same verse, Romans 5, verse 10 in the New Century Version. It says, while we were God's enemies, he made friends with us through the death of his son. Surely now that we are his friends, he will save us through his son's life. In other words, the process does not change. But I'm going to tell you something. I've been around Christians a long time. I, I've been around Christians my whole life. And I know that a lot of you are thinking, well, this is basic, we know this, but I'm going to tell you that many do not know this. And many do not meditate on this. And we, while we may know it up here, it's not how we live. I see many Christians weighted down by guilt. I see many Christians weighted down by condemnation. I see many Christians still trying to please God and gain His favor through their actions. I see it all the time. But our faith that saved us by believing in the cross is the faith that will continue to save us by believing in the cross, in the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. This is where we wanted to get this morning. 1 John 1, 8. I've told you this story before, but I just have to tell it again. I remember the first time I understood, really made sense to me what Jesus did on the cross. I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandpa was, well, let's just say he was aggressive. He was an aggressive man. And uh, he had a little temper on him, and... He could be ornery. Bless his soul. He's not with us anymore. But I remember one day I did something, probably something that I did not deserve to be disciplined for. But my mom was going to discipline me, and she was going to spank my rear end. And we were over at my grandparents' house, which, by the way, we probably need to have more spankings in this generation. probably help a lot. We don't like to spank anymore. We like to put them in time out. But, you know, anyway, that's a whole other subject. But I remember I was there, and my mom was going to spank me, and I was upset, and I was going back to the bedroom, and I forget how young I was, and, you know, seven or eight. And my grandfather stepped in, and he said, No, he said, Don't, don't, please, don't, don't spank him, Tina. Don't spank him. He said... I'll, I'll take it for him. Just, you can spank me. I'll take it for him. And when he said that, you just could see a twinkle go off in her eye. You could see that she'd been looking for this moment for years. <laughs> for all the detriment that he had caused. And, and she said, okay, I'll take you up on that. So, sure enough, she marched Grandpa to the bedroom. And I stayed outside the door. 
And all of a sudden, I heard that leather belt fly through the air and whack. And he yelled, <laughs> he yelled, ow! He said, come on now, Tina. He said, I, didn't think, I don't think he thought she was really going to do it. You know, I thought he was going to take it easy. But no, no, you, you're going to bear the penalty that was, that was his. So she gave him three or four good licks. And I heard her, him yelling at her. And nobody ever made the connection for me. But right there in the moment, I, I'm serious. I just began to see the gospel. I was like, he didn't deserve that. It was nothing that he did, but he stepped in to take the punishment for me. And I know that's a simple example, but you have to understand that the debt has been paid. Now, how unrighteous would it be for her to come out and, and still be holding that over my head as if I still needed to be disciplined, you know? No, he took it for me. And it's the same way with Christ. He paid it. You have to understand once and for all. He's not re-crucified or re-punished every time you sin. His crucifixion paid for your sins, past, present, and future, once and for all. It even paid for the sins. Listen. It even paid for the sins of those who have not repented yet. It even paid, it paid for the entire world's sin. Their debt is paid. They just don't know it yet. They haven't accepted it. it ju- it'd be just like people that are in prison and being offered a way out and, and it's already been paid. They said, you're free to go. And they say, no, we're staying in here. We like it better. That's what the world is doing. They don't understand that their debt has already been paid and they're rejecting it saying, no, we do not want that offer of freedom. We do not want that offer of salvation. We will stay in our darkness and we will stay separated from God, but it's their choice. Their debt has already been paid as well, past, present, and future, yours. It's just we have to believe it and accept it and walk in it. Amen? 1 John 1, 8, he says, he's talking to Christians. Now, some people will argue that John is talking about sinners, uh, people that are not saved yet. But we're gonna, I'm going to show you very clearly that he's not. 1 John 1, 8, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All right? So he's talking to Christians here, and he says, if, if we... So first of all, he includes himself in that statement. If he was talking about the world, he would say, if they. If they say they have no sin. But he doesn't say if they say they have no sin. He says, if we say. So he's talking about John the Apostle is including himself in this statement. So he says, if John says, you could say, if John says that I have no sin, I am deceiving myself and the truth is not in me. Because John includes himself in this passage. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, if he was referring to sinners, this would be a kind of a duh statement. Because he says the truth is, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, if he's talking about worldly people, of course the truth is not in them. That, that's not even, you didn't have to make that point. You don't, he, doesn't, he wouldn't look at a, a person who's not accepted God and say, if they think they have no sin, the truth is not in them. Of course the truth is not in them. They've never accepted the truth. He's talking about a Christian. He's talking about someone who has been saved or thinks they've been saved. If they deny sin, he says, actually, the truth is not in you, even though you think you're saved. So he establishes that. Then he goes on to verse 9, and he tells us what to do when a Christian sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad you have forgiveness in the blood of Jesus this morning? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 2, 1 says, my little children... I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire world. That's what I was saying earlier. The sins of the whole world have been paid for. We just have to announce that news. He is the propitiation. And that word propitiation, it just a, it's just a, a, an old word. It just means a sacrifice that absorbs wrath. Uh, when I was a kid, 
I don't remember what's in this movie, so if there's anything in this movie that, that shouldn't be in there, I've, I've seen it one time, and it was when I was a kid, and it was my mama's fault if I watched it. Now, uh, but anyway, it was this movie called Joe and the Volcano. I don't know if anybody ever seen Joe and the Volcano. It was Tom Hanks was in it. And I don't even remember the movie, but I only remember that, that there was this volcano, and at so many year, every so many years, they had to throw a human sacrifice into the volcano, um, and that person would be sacrificed to absorb the wrath of the volcano, and then it would not erupt. And I don't even remember what happened. I think Tom Hanks was supposed to get thrown in, and I don't remember if he did or not. Probably didn't. But that's propitiation. That's, that's the idea of propitiation. It's a sacrifice that absorbs wrath. And God's wrath towards sin is a very real element and a, a, really, a very real understanding that we need to have about the gospel. There is the wrath of God. And the Bible actually teaches that the wrath of God is being stored up. But it's towards sin not towards those who have been justified. And even the fact, I always say this, people focus sometimes you know, on the wrath of God as if he's this angry, angry God and he has this wrath and he just wants to... Pour out. Even the fact that the wrath of God is being stored up instead of poured out shows you how much he loves humanity. It doesn't have to be stored up at all. It could be poured out whenever he felt like it. But it's being stored up because he's giving space to repent to those that have not come to Christ yet. The wrath of God is being withheld so that those who are far from God can come near to God. And he's given that, that space as, as long as he can. Out of all the scriptures we've read that should be clear that Christians still sin, this is number one, 1 John 2, 1. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he's letting you know, my whole purpose in explaining this is so that you will not sin. And I will say that this morning as well. My whole purpose in talking about this morning is not so that we will sin, it's so that we will not sin, but it's to understand that when you do sin, because inevitably you will, this is where your mind needs to go right here. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. That means that he has already paid for that sin. Why else is John bringing this up? Except to say that when you find yourself in a situation where you've, where you, where you've sinned, Understand that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that has paid for that sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire world. Praise God. So salvation is not just about your past sins. You're not, you're, you're not, your past sins are not just covered by the blood. All of your sin is covered by the blood. Even the world who's not yet repented of their sin, actually has it paid for, they just have to accept it. Praise God. I want to ask the band to come up this morning. One of the reasons that I felt that we needed to talk about this this morning is because as we continue to go through 1 John... The book of 1 John is very strong, as you saw last week, about getting rid of sin in your life. And we're going to do that. But what we just talked about has to lay the foundation for it. You know, it's kind of like my wife and I, or, or your, you and your spouse, coming to marriage in the family and saying, you know what, we're going to commit to go to all five weeks of marriage in the family because we want to work on our relationship. But the foundation for a couple working on their relationship has to be you are accepted and I love you and I'm committed to you no matter what. It's not let's go work on our marriage and if you don't make some of these changes, I'm leaving you. The foundation has to be the, the best, uh, I guess, environment for a person to work on their marriage is to know you are loved, you are accepted, I'm committed to you now. Let's work on some of these things. And that's what the book of 1 John is telling us. I believe that's the, way, the reason it starts the way that it does. 
He's saying, listen, if you sin, there is, there's a propitiation for that. There's a sacrifice for that. But I want to talk to you about the sin in your life because it needs to change. I want to talk to you about the things in your life that you need to get rid of. But I want you to understand that you are righteous before God because of the blood. But let's address some of these sins in your life that you need to get rid of. And that's going to be our study for the rest of John. But we needed that, that foundation this morning. Amen. Let's bow our heads together.